All right, let's, uh, you know, get into it. All right, so we're doing something different here. We're going to, well, it's not different. We've done it before. Cigars, Whiskey, and Winning. Leadership Lessons by General Ulysses S. Grant by Al Kaltman. Yeah, don't recall where I got this one. I think um, I got it in Quantico, Virginia, when I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah, yeah. Simplified would I. <laughs> Even though Grant was an Army man, a West Point graduate there. One of my favorite presidents. So what are we going to do today? Um, I've done it before. And I'm uh, just trying to dial it in. We're gonna lead some. We're gonna read some leadership lessons. That's right. We're gonna take it back. And uh, well, we got we got quite a few of them to do here. Hmm. Some. Uh, so I think we'll do like two. We're gonna read like two. We we'll see where we uh, stand, and maybe we'll go to three. We'll see what the time limit is. Yeah. All right. Let's get into it. For those of you that don't know. Uh, Grant was instrumental during the Civil War. You probably know that. But what you probably didn't know is his presidency, which was largely contingent on the fact that he won the war, well, it was rife with um, controversy and, um, what do you call it, bribery and, well, controversy, I guess. I can't think of any other words. Uh, but <laughs> he, um, he was never at fault. It was just always the people under him taking advantage of him. And since he was a humble man and he had a lot of faith in his friendships, well, people would uh, take advantage of that. So it's unfortunate. But he is on a $50 bill, rightfully so, I reckon. And one of my favorite presidents, I believe. I think uh, Abraham Lincoln gets a lot of uh, credit for um, ending slavery and so forth. But uh, Grant doesn't get enough credit for what he did in uh, helping with all of that. So... Um, Let's get into it. August 1822 to August 1848. Grant's Ohio boyhood ends with his appointment to West Point. His student days at the academy are spent reading novels and riding horses. Graduated as second lieutenant, he serves with distinction in the Mexican War. During the battle for Mexico City, he sees an opportunity to mount a cannon in a bell tower and seizes upon it. For his decisive action, Grant receives several favorable commendations. All right, a little bit of history there for you. Now here is the leadership lesson number one. Bureaucrats do the dumbest things. That's right. The man we know is, well, just a second here. Let me set a little bit of the atmosphere here for you. A little mantra fear from my good friend Chris Lennon Davis. Huh? Well, let me show you a bit. Dial in now. Bureaucrats do the dumbest things. The man we know as Ulysses S. Grant was actually named Hiram Ulysses Grant. As a boy, he was known as Liss. Thomas Hammer, the congressman who appointed Grant to West Point, forgot all about Hiram. Remembering that Grant's mother's maiden name was Simpson, and thinking that Liss was Grant's middle name, he filled out the application in the name of Ulysses S. Grant. When Grant arrived at West Point, and discovered that the academy had registered him under the wrong name. He tried to get the error corrected. He was told that it didn't matter what he or his parents thought of his name. The official government application said his name was Ulysses S. And that application could not be changed. If Hiram U. Grant wanted to attend West Point, he would have to change his name. Here is the leadership lesson. Bureaucrats will blindly obey whatever set of rules they are instructed to follow, even if this leads them to take completely illogical or patently nonsensical action. Try to keep them out of your organization. All right. Also, help prevent your people from turning into bureaucrats by regularly reminding them that your organization's rules and regulations are designed to provide guidance to intelligent human beings who use their heads and are not intended for slavish obedience by automatons. That's right. Bureaucrats do the dumbest things. All right. That was leadership lesson a numero uno. That's a little Spanish for you there. In case you didn't know. 
numero dos, or number two in English. When he was a boy. Oh, keep your cards to yourself. All right. When he was a boy, Grant's schoolmates would make him miserable by repeating the story of the time he cajoled his father into letting him purchase a colt from a Mr. Ralston, who lived a few miles from their village. Mr. Ralston was asking $25, while Grant's father felt that $20 was a fair price for the colt. I once mounted a horse and went for the colt. When I got to Mr. Ralston's house, I said to him, Papa says I may offer you $20 for the quote. Colt, rather. But if you won't take that, I am to offer 22 and a half. And if you won't take that, to give you 25. It would not require a Connecticut man to guess the price finally agreed upon. This true story is nearly true. I certainly showed very plainly that I had come for the colt and meant to have him. I could not have been over eight years old at the time. The lesson. It's all right to want something badly, but you can't bargain effectively any more than you can win a poker hand by laying your cards face up on the table. So keep your cards to yourself. I don't know what accent I'm using, but that got in there. Maybe we're going to keep it. I don't know. Number three, use discipline purposefully. Like most boys, Grant did not like to work. While he did not recall ever being punished at home, he could not say the same for school. The rod was freely used there, and I was not exempt from its influence. I can see John D. White, the school teacher now, with his Long Beach switch always in hand. It was not always the same one either. Switches were brought in bundles from a beech wood near the schoolhouse by the boys for whose benefit they was intended, were intended rather. Often a whole bundle would be used up in a single day. I never had any hard feelings against my teacher either while attending the school or in the latter years when reflecting upon my experience. Mr. White was a kind-hearted man and was much respected by the community in which he lived. The lesson. You can maintain the respect of your staff so long as they recognize that your application of discipline is consistent and even-handed and that you are purposefully use discipline to achieve a worthwhile end. Not simply because you're heartless. And that was leadership lesson number three. Use discipline purposefully. All right. Well, then what are we sitting at here? I think we could go for five. I think we can go for five. Number four. Numero cuatro. Don't mistake appearance for achievement. Grant entered West Point in May 1839. During Grant's freshman year, General Winfield Scott visited the academy and reviewed the cadets. His appearance made quite an impression upon Grant. With his commanding figure, his quite colossal size and showy uniform, I thought him the finest specimen of manhood my eyes could ever behold, and the most to be envied. Upon graduating, Grant couldn't wait to wear the new uniform. He imagined that his old friends would look upon him with the same mixture of awe and envy that he had felt when he saw General Scott. I was impatient to get my uniform and see how it looked, and probably wanted my old schoolmates, particularly the girls, to see me in it. Opposite our house in Benthel stood the old stage tavern where man and beast found accommodation. The stable man was a rather dissipated but possessed of some humor. On my return, I found him parading the streets and attending in the stable barefooted, but in a pair of sky-blue nakeen pantaloons, just the color of my uniform trousers, with a strap of white cotton sheeting sewed down the outside seams in an imitation of mine. The joke was a huge one in the mind of many of the people, 
and was much enjoyed by them, but I did not appreciate it so highly. The lesson. Dress for success if you want to, but don't ever, with yourself or others, mistake appearance for achievement. That's number four. Do not mistake appearance for achievement. Let's move on to number five. Leadership lesson number five, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant found the academy curriculum at West Point very wearisome and uninteresting. He did enjoy mathematics, which came easily to him, and he learned to draw and paint. Grant also spent a great deal of his time reading, and in his senior year served as president of the Cadet Literary Society. There's a fine library connected with the academy from which cadets can get books to read in their quarters. I devoted more time in these than to books relating uh, to the course of studies. Much of the time was devoted to novels, but not those of a trashy sort. The Lesson When hiring college graduates for entry-level management positions, look for cadets with a solid grounding in the liberal arts. You can teach bright young people the technical skills they will need, but you shouldn't have to teach them to read with comprehension, write with clarity, or think for themselves. Nor should you have to teach them to be observant, have a sense of perspective, or be able to reason logically. For those entry-level jobs that do require the completion of a technical course of studies, Try hiring candidates whose technical curriculum has been well supplemented with a first-rate liberal arts education. Number five, but can they think for themselves? That's right, folks. Okay, that was our first reading of Cigars, Whiskey, and Winning Leadership Lessons by Ulysses S. Grant. All right, it's been uh, great, and we're moving on. All right. All right, take care. Yeah.